All right, well, thank you all so much for joining us for a trip to South Central France with the Traveling Librarian. Uh, we're joined by Jeff Claps, the Traveling libra Librarian, for another of his popular armchair travel presentations. This series highlights travel photography and stories and travel tips about destinations around the world. And uh, Jeff is the recently retired head of reference services at the Lucius Beebe Memorial Library in Wakefield, and he's an avid traveler and photographer. I think this might be his fifth or sixth virtual uh, armchair travel presentation with us. Uh, so all 120 of us or so, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Jeff for joining us this afternoon. And Jeff, you can take it away. Thanks so Great. much. Thanks, Tom. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining to, uh, this afternoon. Um, for those of you who are new, welcome. For those of you who have come to the other programs in the past, welcome back. Um, I am going to start. I, I've already started sharing my screen, so I hope you can see that. And we will get started. Um, we are going today uh, to a section of France called the Dordogne, which um, Tom uh, conveniently avoided talking about. Um, and uh, but that's how it's pronounced, Dordogne. Um, it's named after the river. And um, the, many of the, the different parts of France are named after their rivers, but I should also point out that this particular area is also known as the Perigord. That's actually the older name for, for the region. Um, there's a part called the Perigord, Perigord Noir and the Perigord Blanc. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but just to point out the, the geography of where uh, we are way, way down in southern France, um, heading out towards the Atlantic coast of France and the river. As you can see, it's a fairly large river, um, and it's the, the focal point of this whole area. Much of the development, the historical development, historical borders, um, and uh, the, the history of the area, as well as the modern tourism, revolves around the river. So it tends to go by that name now. Um, it's a very popular area with Brits. Um, there are lots of uh, British people who have holiday homes there, expats. So if you travel in that part of France, you're, you're, you might be surprised to hear more English spoken than um, you might see in other parts of France. The big areas that we're going to focus on today are uh, a town called Sarla, um, which is over here. Um, we're also going to stop in Bergerac. Um, which is the Bergerac that you've probably heard of from Cyrano de Bergerac, um, and uh, a couple of other large towns um, and plenty of small villages. What, um, where the river ends up uh, reaching the sea, um, it goes past, um, past Bordeaux, not actually in front of Bordeaux, there's another river there, um, but it connects up with the river uh, near the city of Bordeaux, which is one of uh, France's largest cities and a very beautiful one. Um, and then it opens out into this large estuary called the Gironde, which is a major wine producing area, mostly red wines, but not exclusively. Um, and that's also a very beautiful place to travel as well. Um, but we're going to start actually um, when we when I visited this area, we flew into uh, a very small airport on the coast, which is uh, a nice thing to do. I love flying into small airports because you get in and out quickly and you often are closer to where you want to be. So we went to a place called um, uh, La Rochelle um, and there is an airport there that uh, is probably about as big as like Beverly Airport, which makes it very easy to get in and out. And so we were remarkably close uh, to the Dordogne at that point. And um, we started. Uh, uh, we rented a car, and you really do need a car for this part of France um, to, to be able to see all of the countryside. The first place we stopped was Saint-Emilion, which is, strictly speaking, not really in the Dordogne region, but if you're in that area, it's well worth a visit because um, it's in the Bordeaux wine region, and it's extremely famous for um, one of the most uh, well-known and well-regarded French wines. Um, I don't know if you, many of you are fans of Bordeaux wines, but Saint-Emilion is definitely up there. And um, even if you aren't into wines, it's a gorgeous town. Um, so here's, here's what it looks like. We were there um, in, I believe it was June, um, which is a very nice time to be there weather-wise, although it was a bit hot. 
So many of the photos that you're going to see have beautiful, clear, sunny skies um, and lots of bright green foliage. And that was wonderful, but it was pretty hot for France, um, particularly since we weren't on the coast. Um, and here's just a few views of uh, the area around uh, Saint-Emilion. But we were headed for, and we stayed, stayed for much of the time um, that we were there in this town called Salat la Caneda, which is um, an excellent base. I would highly recommend it if you ever do travel in this area because um, it's a gorgeous town to stay in uh, to begin with. Plus, it has lots of shops, it has lots of restaurants, but it's very centrally located. So if you want to not do a lot of traipsing around in a car um, and going from hotel to hotel, Sala is a superb place to just sort of plunk yourself and then take day trips because almost all of the things that we're going to see that I will show you today are within an hour, maybe an hour and a half of Sarla. So they make excellent day trips. And then of course you can go back to Sarla in the evening, walk about a block to a delicious French restaurant and have uh, really amazing food. We'll talk a little bit more about food too because every region of France has its own regional cuisine and the Perigord, the Dordogne area is um, very well known for a very rich um, food. Uh, it's a cuisine that often goes by the name of forestière, uh, which refers to foods that come from the forest. So there are mushrooms and um, uh, cherries and walnuts and uh, cheeses that are local to that area and uh, geese and foie gras. That's a lot of those are the kinds of things that are very typical of the, the cooking in this area. We stayed in a wonderful uh, place um, called the Hotel de Recollet, uh, sorry, um, which is actually a 12th century Benedictine abbey that has been converted into a very comfortable hotel. Um, all of Sarla is only about 10,000 people. It's a, it's a very comfortable, um, walkable medieval town. Um, you can see me up in the, uh, we were up in the attic, um, which was, very nice, except for the lack of air conditioning, because as I said, it was pretty hot, um, but we managed fine. Um, and just a couple of pictures of the area around the town. Uh, most of it is pedestrianized, uh, which makes it a delightful place to walk around because there's very little traffic. Um, you park your car outside of the town and then pretty much all except for one um, major shopping street is pretty much all pedestrianized. So you you actually kind of have a medieval feel while you're there. And I'll show you a number of the buildings in the town. This this odd one here, which looks kind of like a missile silo or something, um, is called the Lanterne des Morts. And um, it's a 12th century funeral chapel. But what's interesting about it is it's pretty much solid. Um, there are no doors to get in and out, and it's kind of a mystery even to this day exactly beyond just being a, a memorial um, structure of what exactly it was used for and why it was designed in the particular way it was. There are some beautiful parks in Salah. Um, here's some examples of trees. Um, the, the French, if you travel in France, you've probably seen this a lot. They obsessively trim their trees as well as their shrubs and gardens and so forth. Um, this is what they call pollarding, where they, um, and most of the trees that you're seeing here are probably um, platan or sycamores um, in that family of trees that are very common in French parks. And the, the idea of pollarding is that every season they really cut them back so that the trunks continue to grow um, in in uh, diameter, but the trees themselves don't actually get very large. And then the foliage springs up the next year, but they end up um, staying very much in control rather than becoming full-size trees. Uh, strolling around Sarla is absolutely gorgeous. There are tons of medieval buildings. The entire center of the town um, is uh, all medieval structures, um, most of which have been very nicely restored. Um, Here's one of the main squares, the Place de la Liberté. Um, back to the whole thing about French trees. Here's, here's um, a very typical French uh, public worker obsessively trimming the trees into box shapes. 
Um, but again, as I said, one of the nice things about Sarla is how close it is to all these really, really um, interesting um, sites that are within maybe uh, an, an easy, like less than an hour's driving distance. One of the most famous ones is right across the river. This is a 12th century fort fortification across what originally was um, the border, believe it or not, between France and England. Um, this is back in the days of Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine. Um, we are in the area very close to Aquitaine. And um, at that point in history, um, a significant part of France was actually under the control of England. So the Dordogne River actually was the border between those two um, kingdoms. And as a result, there are a large number of castles that were built, um, as you might imagine, along a military border, a, an international border, um, to watch out for raids and battles and, and to control the area. Um, and because the Dordogne River cuts through a lot of limestone geology, there's a number of cliffs along the way, which are ideal spots for castles to be built because they allow you to see up and down the river. This one is called Castelno, um, uh, or I, I beg your pardon, this is across from Castelno. I'll show you Castelno in a minute. Um, so the Chateau de Benac and the Chateau de Castelno, which you can see off in the background of this photo, are literally across the river from each other. They were almost like fighting neighbors. Um, keeping an eye on each other um, only a kilometer or two apart uh, over the river valley. Um, there's a lot of agriculture in the Dordogne Valley because um, in between the cliffs, um, there's extremely rich uh, agricultural land with very arable soil. So there's a lot of um, hay, there are vineyards, um, and a lot of other kinds of agriculture. Um, the river winds its way very uh, lazily through this valley, um, and that also makes it popular for boating um, and a lot of other things. It's, it's navigable only up to a certain point because it's fairly shallow, um, but it's very good for just general atmosphere and also for lots of um, passive water sports, things like um, canoeing and kayaking and so forth. Um, very close to Sarla is a place that you should not miss, particularly if you like um, gardens. And there are a number of gardens I'll point out here. Um, this one is called the Jardin Suspendu de Marquesat. And Suspendu means suspended, hanging. Um, they're called the hanging gardens because they're way up on a cliff and they um, kind of cascade down the sides of this uh, bluff overlooking the river valley. Um, the um, it's, it's maybe 15, 20 minutes from Sarla, very close. Um, but although the, the chateau that goes um, with these gardens is a little bit older from the 18th century, most of the topiary and other gardens that you see are, are later from the 19th century. And it was uh, completely redesigned at that point as a sort of fantasy romantic topiary garden. And it really is quite incredible. It's all done by hand, which is even more incredible. They don't use electric um, or gas uh, hedge trimmers. It's all done by um, a group of, I believe it was six um, gardeners who handle all of this, uh, these many, many acres of topiary. And it looks down into this beautiful um, valley where hay is being grown and there are um, villages off in the distance. Um, here you can see a good example of uh, a typical kind of tourist boat. Um, this, this particular type was called the Bagar and was originally a river boat for transporting goods and passengers up and down the river. Now um, it's used exclusively for tourists. You can just take a boat ride up and down the river, um, but they use the same style of boat. Um, and some more views of the, uh, the gardens. Um, from that area, you can see um, another town, which we'll visit in more detail a little bit later, called La, La Roque Gajac, which is um, we're seeing here from the gardens of Marquesac down, uh, down below along the riverbank. This is a small village of only about 400 people. Um, it was even smaller in the Middle Ages. And you can kind of see, it's hard, uh, I think I have a better picture later on, but um, in the cliffs up above, you can kind of see that there's a discoloration. 
Um, and that's because in the late 1950s, the, um, the cliff actually collapsed and destroyed a number of houses in the village below and killed three people. Um, there was another rock fall a few years ago, not, not long before we were there, where they closed the road because they were afraid the cliff was going to collapse. Um, but I'll show you some up close pictures of that town a little bit later. Um, and again, just looking along this long spine where um, there are uh, both very elaborately topiary gardens and also some wilderness paths. So if you like anything having to do with um, with gardens or country homes, it's an excellent place to visit. Here's a better close-up view of La Oak. And in fact, from uh, Marquesat, you can see almost all of the major castles um, in, in all directions because it sticks out kind of on a, on a promontory over the river. So La Roque is in one direction, Benat is um, across the river, Castelnau is, uh, is in the other direction. And here is the chateau itself um, from the 18th century. Um, the river itself, I should talk a little bit about the river. Here's an, uh, a very typical view of it. Um, it rises in what's known as the Massif Central, which is a uh, very mountainous region um, in the center of France, um, not as high as the Alps, but it's a fairly mountainous and also very um, sparsely populated part of France. And it runs west um, out of the mountains for about 500 kilometers before it jo joins the Gironde estuary, which I showed you on the map, not far from the city of Bordeaux. Um, and it's navigable most of the way, at least until you start to get up into the mountains, and was a major historical route. Um, again, being, being an international border, it was also a very important um, uh, route for uh, merchants who were moving goods from one place to another and getting them out to Bordeaux and to, to the Atlantic Ocean for shipping elsewhere. Um, here's a closer up view of the Chateau of Benac and the village. Uh, many of the villages that I'm gonna show you are on the list of what France officially calls the most beautiful villages of France. And that, that's an actual official thing. <laughs> There's uh, villages in France can aspire to be uh, named one of the most um, one of the most beautiful villages of France. And if they get that designation, they get extra money and it, it helps to promote tourism and so forth. Um, of course, there are literally hundreds of villages in France that could probably qualify for being on that list, and they aren't. Um, but um, the ones that are are likely to see a little bit more tourism and you're more likely to see shops and restaurants and uh, guest houses and so forth. Um, but many of them have this typical medieval look um, when we were there, this house was for sale. Um, and uh, if you are interested in real estate in France, the Dordogne is an excellent place to look because they're used to having foreigners um, buy holiday homes there. And uh, we, again, we were fortunate enough to be there in, in the late spring, early summer. So uh, all the gardens were out. There were roses and lilacs and, and you name it. In most of the villages that have a castle, um, not surprisingly, the castle occupies a very prominent um, high point where um, it's more easily defensible. And then the villages usually tend to be down low because um, they would have been more involved in river traffic and, and so forth. Um, there's nothing, to me, there's nothing more delightful than just strolling the back alleys of villages like this. Um, you may come across a beautiful view. Here's a nice cemetery, a garden. Um, while we were there, all the lavender was out, which was very nice to see. Um, and here, not far from Castelnau, which is the, um, the castle right across the river, um, is what the French called an eco musée, which is a uh, a museum dedicated to nature, kind of a natural history museum, but even more specifically to agriculture. And this one was fun because 
there is so much agriculture that's specific to this region um, that it was interesting to see what kinds of livestock they raise there, what kinds of uh, crops they grow. Um, as I said, cherries are big there, walnuts. I'm here actually sitting on, um, if you're wondering what that is, it's a giant concrete walnut um, um, right under a walnut tree. And so the museum was great because it talked a lot about how they grow and harvest things like apricots, walnuts, cherries, almonds, and a lot of the other crops that are grown in that area, as well as livestock, geese are very, very big in, um, in the Dordogne area, um, not just for uh, cooking of meat, you'll find goose on a lot of menus in restaurants, um, but also because this is one of the major producers of foie gras um, in, in France. And although foie gras is um, because of the unpleasant way in which the geese are treated in order to produce uh, foie gras, even in France, the, where, where it originates, um, there is a pretty strong movement to start moving away from that because of um, its considered uh, cruelty to the geese. Um, however, you will still find uh, geese on the menu um, the way you would any other kind of poultry. Um, another town uh, that's not far from Sarlam, um, again, with a spectacular view out over the valley, um, is called Dom, D-O-M-M-E, -M -M -E, and it's on the south bank. And it's an excellent example of a kind of town called a Bastide. And these were, there's a lot of these in the area, they were towns specifically built um, with fortifications. And they were created to populate these areas um, along the border. And again, uh, we're going back to the time period where we were basically looking across the river to England. Um, and unlike a lot of the older communities that have the little medieval streets, um, in this case, most of the um, these Bastide towns were built according to a more military plan. So they have a grid pattern, which is very unusual for um, medieval towns. If you've traveled around Europe, you expect the quirky little narrow passageways whereas a Bastide is very regular, has um, most of the important buildings are in the center where they were most protected. So we'll see the church, um, the market hall, um, and then completely surrounding the village would be enormous protective walls like this one. Um, Dom is probably the, the most famous and, and best preserved of the Bastide towns, but there are quite a few others. Um, and they're all built up high, again, for protection and um, visibility along the river. Um, here's uh, a closer up view of La Roque that I talked about before. Um, and I want to take you to another garden. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of gardens and botanical gardens in general or any kind of garden. And this one is um, unusual because it's modern and completely different from a lot of the other things that you're likely to see in France. This is a 17th century house, uh, and the gardens go back to the 18th century, but almost everything that I'm showing you today is 20th century um, because it was very overgrown and um, it's, it's still privately owned um, and was restored by the father of the current owner who turned all of the, um, the formal gardens around the property into an amazing topiary garden. And what's interesting about them is uh, they're all green. There is almost no um, color in this garden. Um, it's called the Manoir de Rignac. And if you are lucky, you might get there on a day when it's foggy because then you, you would swear you're in a fantasy uh, film. Um, because it's all evergreens um, and very modern style. You can see the, a lot of the shapes are very geometric, very modern, um, and there are lots of little hidden rooms. The, about the only color that you're likely to see is white. Um, so it's a very themed garden with just the most spectacular um, uh, sculptures, essentially, out of, out of evergreens. The manor itself um, is also very beautiful, although you can't visit it because it's privately owned and the people, the family actually still live in it. 
um, but the gardens are um, free to explore. Here's the the house itself, which is quite comfortable as as French chateaus go. It's actually um, it looked very very livable. Um, here's their their outdoor garden. Wouldn't you love to just sit out there with a a glass of champagne? Um, but I did like it because unlike so many other fa fancy um, gardens that you're likely to visit, having one that was almost entirely green is uh, just a, a very, it, it's just such a unique um, design idea. Um, they did have one spot um, overlooking uh, the valley where they did have a few uh, colored plants, um, but the vast majority is this um, these long alleys of elaborately sculpted evergreens. Um, with the exception being this one garden that was all white. This is the only place where you really saw anything that wasn't green. And this is a very modern garden. It's actually Asian inspired. And was built much more recently. I, in fact, I think it was actually post war. Um, the other um, good reason to be there at this time of year, besides the lavender, is it's also poppy season. So um, as you're driving around, you may see fields of either cultivated or wild poppies. And it's just, it's glorious to see um, the bright green of the French summer. Um, with fields and fields of bright orange. Another place not far from Erignac, um, if you like chateaus, um, this is more akin to the kind of chateau that you would see in the Loire Valley, um, a Renaissance chateau as opposed to a medieval one. And the main difference being that medieval chateaus were probably more likely built for protection, um, whereas Renaissance chateaus were far more likely to be um, non-military in use. They were more for exhibiting cultural power and wealth. Um, and that's uh, exactly what the Chateau de Hautefort is. Um, it was built uh, much later in the 16th century and, and a little bit after that. Um, it, the, the pepper pot domes that you see are reminiscent of a couple of the other chateaus in the Loire Valley, like Valence, if you've ever been there. Um, and it was purchased um, in the early 20th century, like uh, sometime around 1929 or so, by uh, a guy who <laughs> had a funny name. He was the Baron of Bastard. Um, there's a name. And so he completely renovated this in the early 20th century and then had to do it again because his daughters were in college um, in the late 1960s. And during one of their breaks, they brought some friends home and were up in the attics and accidentally started a fire, which did tremendous damage. Um, talk about how to make your parents angry is to, you know, burn down their chateau. Um, but they did uh, renovate it again. And now, um, although it is, is still privately owned, it is open to the public as another place to visit. Um, and the village of Otfor, which is right below it, um, is also a lovely place to visit. And Otfor, so you can visit the interior of the chateau. Um, and it also is very famous for its gardens. And this was a, an excellent time to be there with all the, um, the topiary. Otfor is built up quite high. So there are several levels, um, different uh, sort of esplanades on different levels of the, of the hillside um, with a different style of garden on each one high up above the village. And the building that you can see off in the distance, which looks very similar to the chateau, um, is actually um, a hospital, uh, an old hospital that was built about the same time in the same style um, to serve uh, the people in and around the village. So if you've been to the Loire Valley, you'll 
recognize this style. There are many chateaux um, up in that area that uh, have have this kind of look. Um, Haute Four in, in the Dordogne, there are very few chateaus uh, built in this time period because most of them were the older ones. So this makes kind of a, a nice diversion because it's so different from most of what, uh, what else you will see there. And here I am trying to pretend it belongs to me. Welcome to my chateau. I mentioned that um, geese are very popular um, and you will see um, uh, goose farming all over um, the area. Some of which, as I said, is still used for um, making foie gras, pate, um, but a lot of it is just used for, um, uh, it's eaten in much the same way that duck or any other poultry would be served. Um, goose tends to be on the, um, tends to be on the fatty side. Um, so it's very rich, and that 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 tends to inform how all of the cuisine in the area is. M much of the cuisine in Berry Gord is very rich, very heavy um, peasant-style food made from local ingredients. Um, we took a day trip uh, a little further away from where we've been so far, um, but still not very far, maybe an hour and a half or so, um, to... Um, an important pilgrimage site. Uh, we passed this pretty chateau on the way um, to a town called Roca Madur. Um, and what looks like a chateau here is actually the public toilets in the village, to give you an idea of how chic Roca Madur is, um, surrounded by lavender, of course. Um, Roca Madur is only about 600 people, and it's built on a tributary of the Dordogne called the Alzu River, which is very small. Um, but it's a very important pilgrimage um, site um, going way back to the 12th century um, and mostly reconstructed over the last couple hundred years. Um, and for many centuries, it was on the route to Santiago de Compostela, the pilgrimage routes. There were many different ones that worked their way through central and southern France across the Pyrenees into northern Spain all the way to Santiago in northwestern Spain. And this was a major site um, for pilgrims along the way. Um, it's historically very important, but um, probably even more so is just the, the dramatic location. It's situated at the top of this extremely narrow valley that goes down to the river. And the, the pilgrimage church, the bishops, um, uh, castle and so forth are all built um, in, into the sides of the cliff, and then the village itself um, works its way down um, a narrow um, street all the way down to the river. And even today, um, particularly for uh, modern French Catholics, it's a very important uh, pilgrimage site. Uh, here's the gate going in. Um, and you can walk all the way down and look up at the church, which is very famous for its Black Madonna, uh, which I'll show you in just a moment. Um, there's a long series of steps where pilgrims, uh, really devout pilgrims, will um, climb up on their knees uh, to get up to the top. And much of what you're seeing here, these buildings were um, connected to the church. The, these, these are places where the bishops lived um, and all of the uh, the structures that were built to accommodate and serve the many, many pilgrims um, that visited here. Pilgrimage sites tended to be very wealthy because, of course, they, um, they attracted people from far and wide, um, and those people came and uh, spent money while they were in these places, much as tourists do today. So, uh, important pilgrimage sites were, um, it, it was very desirable to be a pilgrimage site because you, you could uh, greatly increase the wealth of the village and of the church at the same time. But it's, it is a beautiful spot. And inside the church, you can see how it's built literally into the cliff. Um, 
Unfortunately, this is not a very good photo, but you can just see um, the famous Black Madonna, um, who is Black not by race, but by soot, <laughs> um, to be perfectly honest. Um, and there are some amazing uh, frescoes that, because they were protected under the under the cliffs, um, they are in relatively good condition, given given their exposure to the elements. And here's a general view of it. Um, it's it's really quite a dramatic spot. and right out of the picture postcard. If you get tired of chateaus and quaint little villages, I can also highly recommend the area because uh, there's a wealth of caverns um, and uh, both more recently discovered and, and very old ones. Uh, and this is because of the geology of the area, which is for the most part um, uh, limestone. And limestone is very porous, so over the millennia, um, water drips down and caves develop. Um, so there's a number of caves that have spectacular um, formations of stalactites and stalagmites and that, that sort of thing. Um, and also uh, quite a few caves that have prehistoric art, and I would highly recommend those as well. This particular one is called the Bouffre de Padirac. Um, and it's, you can see how enormous it is. Um, it's a giant hole in the ground and there's a stairway that you hike all the way down to get to the bottom where there is an underground river. Um, and it goes down almost a thousand feet into the, um, into the rock. And there are enormous chambers, underwater lakes, um, and you can ride a boat and, and so forth. It's quite impressive. Um, however, I think if I had to choose, I personally found the uh, the caves that had um, prehistoric art in them far more impressive. And here's a couple of examples. Uh, Fontebom, uh, you've probably heard of Lascaux, I'm sure, that which was one of the first to be discovered in the 20th century. And another one that we visited called the Grotte uh, de Rufignac. Um, many of these caves are small. Um, and because of the, uh, the potential damage to the uh, extremely old artworks in them, um, they very often limit the number of people who can visit at any one time. So if you are interested in this kind of thing, do be sure to plan way ahead um, because um, they, particularly in the, the busy summer months, which where when tourism is at its highest, um, the tours book up very quickly um, because they may only allow uh, six to 10 people in the cave per day. Um, so definitely plan ahead. Um, I'll show you a couple more in a minute. Um, but we did go back to Sarla for the evening. Here's just some more views around the town, including the main um, thoroughfare that's it, their, their equivalent of Newbury Street, let's put it that way all kinds of shops um, geared not just to tourists, but also all the locals to do their shopping. Um, and it is a, it's it's the one main street in the town that isn't pedestrianized, but they do close it off on the weekends um, on market day. And even that is pedestrianized. Here's the old Bishop's Palace in Sarla, which has now been turned into the tourist office. Um, and a better view of that um, Lanterne de Mort that I showed you at the very beginning. Sarla is really like walking back in time. The, the entire downtown area is completely um, restored medieval in, in superb condition. Um, there's also a lot of um, market days that go on there. It's, it's a major market town uh, today as it was in medieval times. So um, being able to be there when all of the, the downtown uh, plazas are full of people selling local produce and, and other goods is a lot of fun. Um, here's the view of the full moon from our, our garret window. Um, I'm gonna take you quickly up a little side 
um, tributary of the, excuse me, of the Dordogne in a valley called the Vizere, which is a very important one because there are so many uh, prehistoric caves along this particular little river. Um, one of the places to visit that's completely unlike anything you'll see anywhere, I think, um, is called La Roque Saint Christophe, which is actually a medieval town. This is not prehistoric, but you can see from the location, um, it's it was built and carved partway up the mountain um, in, into the soft stone. Here's a model of what it originally would have looked like. Um, and this was a medieval village built for protection, um, I don't know, 50 feet or 100 feet up above the ground um, so that um, it just it, it was better protection. Um, but to have um, a, a medieval cliff town like this, it, it reminded me a little bit um, of some of the uh, cliff dwellings that we see in the Western United States. If you visit any, any of those kinds of ruins, completely different culture, completely different time period, but the same basic idea, um, building into the rock cliffs uh, for protective purposes. So it's a fascinating place to visit. Um, and you can see along the Vizier, um, there are caves all along. And it's interesting because this is another of the rivers that kind of twizzles its way along with lots of little um, meanders. And there are caves on almost every little promontory. And it was used um, very early on with um, by lighting fires and smoke signals and, and so forth as a way of communicating quickly down the river um, because you can see from one cave to another um, to relay messages. Um, here's some more, another picture of uh, La Roque, which is mostly in ruins now, but they've restored enough of it that you can get an idea of what it would have been like to live there um, and a view down the valley. There are some excellent little villages to see, villages where there really isn't much. Um, there may be a cafe, um, maybe if you're lucky, a little guest house, but a lot of them are just tiny little villages that have beautiful churches like this Romanesque one in San Leon. Um, historic buildings and gardens. If you like exploring, it's just a, it's a perfect place to just wander and see what you come up with. Um, you'll stumble upon the most beautiful little places. Um, and this one, this is um, on the way to, we're, we're heading up this little river valley, the Vizier, and we stopped at an animal park called Le Tot, um, which is kind of a companion site to a lot of the um, prehistoric ruins, or, or prehistoric caves, rather. Um, and what they have tried to do here is have um, it, it's it's an actual animal park with live live animals, and all of the animals in the park are um, species or varieties that would have been um, used um, or alive in prehistoric times. Um, so the aurochs that was in the previous picture, um, this is an unusual horse called Przewalski's horse, which is the only species of horse that has a mane that actually stands up straight <laughs> um, rather than flopping over. Um, they even have a mammoth. This obviously is not a real mammoth, um, but they also had things like European bison, uh, which were very common in uh, Neolithic times, smaller than the American bison, although they look similar. So the idea is to give you a, a sense of what kinds of animals would have uh, been around in the time when um, prehistoric people were living in these uh, in this area. I don't know if any of you have ever read, um, they're kind of uh, dated these days, but Jean Owl, the famous uh, author from, I think she started writing in the 80s. She has a whole series of epic novels um, that started with The Clan of the Cave Bear. And they're one of the few series of historical fiction that um, tries to reimagine what it would have been like to live in prehistoric times. Because of course, we we know relatively little about what daily life would have been like that uh, then. But she does a very good job of giving kind of a realistic 
um, image of what life might have been like. And um, this park is trying to contribute to that as well by talking about um, how these people would have lived, what kinds of animals they would have would have seen. Um, we did stop at Lasco, which is probably the best known of any of the caves in the area. Um, this is a view of the valley from the entrance to the cave. These are paintings that are approximately 17,000 um, years old. Um, the cave was originally discovered completely by accident in 1940 um, and open to the public, um, obviously as a, a big tourist draw. Um, but in 1963, they closed it because they discovered that having so many human beings traipsing through um, did significant damage to the artwork. Um, these caves tend to have a constant temperature and a constant humidity. So when you bring human beings in who are exhaling, uh, perhaps even touching the walls when they're not supposed to, um, but changing the temperature and the humidity inside allows mold to grow um, and can cause long-term damage and permanent damage to the paintings, um, particularly since uh, most of the paintings that you're seeing um, have some degree of uh, natural biological ingredients like um, fat and pigments from um, from nuts and minerals and so forth. So they are very susceptible to damage from bacteria, um, mold, mildew, and other kinds of things. So at any rate, they closed Lasco and opened something called Lasco II, um, just around the corner, which opened in the early 1980s. And that's what you would visit today if you were there. I'll go back for just a sec. Um, you would swear if they didn't tell you that this was a replica, you would never know. They have essentially recreated um, down to the tiniest detail, the shape of the rocks um, and all the artwork exactly as the original cave looks. Um, and in fact, all of the artwork in Lasco too was created in um, using the exact same techniques and the same uh, substances. Um, so this is not painted with Benjamin Moore. Um, they actually, the artists tried to recreate the art in exactly the same way that the original artists would have done. Um, and it really is, it's its incredible. So don't, if you go there, don't let the fact that it's a replica um, turn you off. It's, it's absolutely well worth visiting. Um, right around the corner is another pleasant little village called Saint-Amont. Um, that has what looks like a castle, but it's actually a church. Um, this was an Augustinian abbey, um, but they were smart. They built their churches to serve as protection from raids and pirates and so forth. Um, that's a gorgeous little town. Um, here's another one called Martel, named for Charles Martel. You may have heard of him um, if you studied medieval history. His name means hammer, and he was known as Charles the Hammer. He defeated the Saracens at uh, a famous battle at Poitiers in further north in France um, in the eighth century. And so he founded a church in this little village um, and a town grew up around it and they named it after him. Here's a view of it up on, on its little hill. Um, Further up um, on the Dordogne, way, way up as you get towards the mountains, there's another beautiful little medieval town called Beaulieu sur Dordogne. After a while, many of these villages start to look the same. So um, if you tire of this thing, you could easily pick just a few um, to visit and skip some of the others, depending on what kinds of things you're interested in. But Beaulieu is very famous for this church um, because it has an important Romanesque uh, tympanum. That's the word for this um, arched uh, panel over the doors that dates to the early um, 13th century. And uh, it is in absolutely excellent condition. Um, it, it's hard to believe that this is what, 900 years old now? I can't do math. And it's just a, a delightful spot to picnic by the river. 
and not far from it is another town called Colonge, uh, Colonge La Rouge, which is also very tiny with like just a couple hundred people. And this, I think, was worth visiting just again because it's so different. It's called La Rouge because um, the local stone is a very distinctive red sandstone, which is unusual in this part of France. And almost all the buildings in the town are built um, instead out of limestone and not out of granite, but out of this beautiful red sandstone. So it has a particular look and feel that's that's unique in the area. Um, I'm going to point out just quickly this um, specific aspect of the architecture. You'll see in this photo that there are two kinds of tiles, roof tiles. Um, they're called lows. That's the local word for slate roof tiles. And most of what you're going to see are the more recent ones, very nice, smooth. Um, um, but the older ones, which are historic and could be hundreds and hundreds of years old, um, you will see on um, some of the houses. And in some places, you'll see both because it's virtually impossible to get the original ones now. Um, because they they just don't exist. Um, so when new houses are being built or being restored, they tend to use the, the more modern version. Um, but that's why you will occasionally see a mix of the two in a single building. Um, here's a good example of two of the crops that were going on at the time, lavender and cherries. Uh, lots of the local cuisine, particularly the desserts, as you would expect, um, have lots of cherries. In them. And here's Collange from a little further away. Another little town called Turin. Every few kilometers, there's a gorgeous town like this that you can stop and visit. Um, and back in the river valley itself, um, here's a, a better view of the kind of um, what they call sangle in French, which is refers to the meanders, the curves um that the Dordogne River has um through much of its several hundred kilometer journey to the sea and as you go west um uh, a nice place to stop is Bergerac which is a pretty good sized town much bigger than some of the places we've seen so far um, and it is the center of a very uh big wine growing area um, as you get closer to the Bordeaux region. Um, and here's a statue of Cyrano de Bergerac. Um, he was based on a real person. There actually was a, um, a real military uh, man from the 17th century, but that guy had absolutely no connection whatsoever to the town of Bergerac. And it wasn't until 1897 when um, Edmond uh, Rostand wrote the very now famous um, story of Cyrano de Bergerac that his that, that this man's name became connected with the town and because they're not stupid even though there isn't any real connection they adopted him anyway um, because it's a great way to get tourists to come to Bergerac and now you can buy Cyrano stuff all over the town and there's even this statue to him but aside from Cyrano it's a very nice town um, to visit it's a it's a bigger place closer to the size of Sarlat, um, and also a very good base. If you wanted to explore the area, you could kind of put yourself in Bergerac for a few days um, and take day trips. There's a lot of um, medieval and Renaissance style building there, um, and some excellent museums um, connected with, uh, particularly with uh, the history of the city and also the history of wine growing in the area. Um, and if you're into wine, um, if you don't have time to work your way further north into the um, uh, the Bordeaux region, um, very close to Bergerac, just a few kilometers uh, south, um, is a lovely little chateau called Montbaziac, which is known for its sweet wine. Um, and the it's if you've had Sauternes, which is also kind of not far from this area, um, it's a very sweet dessert wine made in a particular way. Um, the chateau here is from the 16th century, um, and you can visit and uh, do wine tastings 
Uh, Mombasiak is available in this country, but not it's not as widely exported as, um, as Sauterne is, but it is a lot cheaper if you find it. Um, and it's delicious, um, slightly chilled with, with pears and cheese or something for dessert, it's, it's wonderful. Um, but the chateau is very nice to visit. And you have a beautiful view over the um, vineyards back to uh, the city of Bergerac off in the distance. And you can do wine tastings and also um, uh, vineyard visits and so forth. And you can buy wine if you like. Um, Mombasiak is, um, has a, it, it's sweet, but it's got a slightly different taste from Sauterne. Um, and it's usually sold in half bottles um, when you buy it here. Um, but um, give it a try if you like sweet wines. It's very, very good. Um, another chateau very close by is one called Lanquet. Um, which has, it's old, but it's been kind of added to over the centuries. But what's kind of fun about it is now you can stay in it. Um, they have a couple of rooms that are available um, as uh, for overnight guests. And you'd probably have to plan, again, pretty far ahead to make sure you could reserve a room. But if you know you're going to be in the area, um, give it a try, because it's it's always fun to stay um, in, a, in an old Renaissance chateau. Um, at the very beginning, I mentioned that the Dordogne region is all, also goes by the name of Perigord, which is a more, it's an older name. Um, and the Perigord Noir and the Perigord Blanc are two different sides, kind of north and south of the river. And one of the reasons why it's referred to as the Perigord Noir is because a lot of the forest in this area is very dark and um, kind of creepy. Um, and Part of that is because so much of the forest in this area is walnuts. So these are walnut trees, um, many of which grow wild throughout the region, and um, many of which are actually grown uh, commercially for the harvesting of walnuts, which are extremely important in French cooking. In fact, the word nut um, in France is the same as the word for walnut, because the walnut is considered sort of the um, the archetype of any kind of nut. Um, unless you specify otherwise, when you refer to a nut in France, you mean walnuts, um, for the most part. This is that same chateau from, from another side. Um, back in Sarla, you can see that even, even in the municipal parking lot, they pollard all the trees to keep them under control. We enjoyed coming back to Sarla every evening because um, we found several restaurants that we really liked and would go back and um, try different things on the menu. And they were all basically just, you know, a five minute walk from our hotel. Way up in the roofs. Um, and I did want to show you a couple of photos of the major market day that they do in Sala. Um, every week they do this and it takes over two or three of the big um, squares. And even if you're not planning to buy anything, it's almost like a museum of local products. So you can see here we have vinegar, uh, all different kinds of um, oils um, made from walnut oil, made from um, uh, I can't think of the name in English. Noisette, hazelnuts, took me a minute. And of course, fresh produce like cherries, cheeses, um, fresh peaches and apricots, um, and all kinds of um, cooked foods as well. There, um, Here you can see um, a lot of the stuff that they make out of uh, ducks and geese. So there are, there's pate, uh, there's even Mombasiak wine, and strawberries. It's, it's just a great way to pass the morning. Um, and also, if, if you want, uh, it's a good way to um, buy things for a picnic and then just go off somewhere and sit by the river and have some delicious local food by the side of the river with a, with a loaf of French bread. Um, this is another one of the very um, 
old buildings um, that has been turned into a very swanky hotel in Sarlo. Um, all manner of sausages. Um, here there are sausages with, let's see, uh, herbs, uh, bison, duck, um, uh, chestnuts, cheese, uh, donkey, <laughs> believe it or not, pepper, um, sanglier is wild boar, and wazette, uh, again, is hazelnut. So all different kinds of sausages made with different ingredients. And mushrooms. Um, I think I mentioned that mushrooms are a big part of the local cuisine because it's such a forested area. Um, morels are very, very popular there. Um, and um, lots of different other kinds of forest mushrooms, including, if you're brave, um, trumpets of death. We didn't try those. Um, a chateau that's um, worth visiting also more for the history connected to it than the building itself, although it's very pretty, is the Chateau de Milan, which is um, pretty close to Sarla. This uh, was originally built in the 14th century, but it was uh, it's more famous for its 20th century owner. Um, it was purchased in the 1930s by Josephine Baker, um, the, um, the very famous um, American, African-American singer who ended up um, becoming the darling of, of French culture for so long, particularly during the war. Um, it is now a museum of her life. Um, so there are many of her costumes. She lived in this, um, in this chateau, but she, um, she uh, donated it uh, to the state afterwards. And now there is, um, it's basically a museum of her and her life. And um, so it's a wonderful place to visit to learn about um, uh, just a fascinating figure in, in history and how she bridged American and French culture. Um, and there's a nice view out over the valley again. Here I am in the cafe again, trying to pretend that I live here. Um, in a tiny little town called Belves, we stopped because being a librarian, I always have to stop at a library if there happens to be one. And this mu little municipal library in this tiny town that has only about a thousand people, um, it's only open like three hours a week, but we happened to drive through while it was open. So of course I had to go in and stop and talk to the librarians. And I kind of have to say, Librarians in no matter what country I've ever been in, they all look the same. Like every, you can tell a librarian <laughs> a mile away. And these were just delightful. We had we had a great talk about the differences of libraries in our countries and being in, in different size communities and so forth. It was it was a lot of fun. Um, and we're kind of making a circle to go back to Sarla. Um, on the south side of the river, this is an abbey called Cadouin. Um, very early um, structure um, started in the 11, early 1100s um, because a relic of Christ's shroud, the part supposedly the part that wrapped Christ's head, um, was connected with this abbey and it became an enormous pilgrimage center um, along the lines of Rocamadour and so many of these other places. Um, and so it was it was a major uh, stop on the Santiago route for centuries. Uh, until 1934, when um, they did testing on the shroud and discovered that, um, unfortunately, um, this was not the crowd, this could not have been the shroud that wrapped Christ's head because, in fact, it was much younger. It was a medieval um, piece of fabric. And worse, it was determined to be Muslim. So, so much for all those uh, centuries of pilgrimage. Um, however, today, um, so it's lost the cachet of the connection with um, the shroud, but it is still an absolutely exquisite um, uh, medieval building to visit with um, incredible Romanesque carvings uh, throughout the building. Um, and 
almost home again, back to Sarla. Um, we stopped again at the town that I mentioned early on called La Roque. Here are just some pictures of the town built literally into the side of the cliff, which makes it very beautiful unless some of the cliff falls on your house. Um, you can see some people kayaking. It's a wonderful river for that kind of thing. And just strolling along the banks and then getting something to drink or eat. Um, and the last day trip we took, um, a little further, but not too much further, um, was to a, a fairly good sized city called Kaor, which we'll get to in just a minute. But on the way are a couple of other beautiful little villages. This one's called Saint Cyr la Popie. Um, this is actually not the Dordogne Valley, but um, the next river south called the Lot, um, which is technically in Quercy, which is another region of France. And this little village um, perched up high um, on a sort of plug of rock over the over the river. Uh, only about 200 people live here. And this was named for Saint-Cyr, um, who died in Asia and his relic relics were eventually brought back to this, uh, to his village. Um, and now this is in fact, one of those most beautiful villages of France. And it certainly is gorgeous. Um, the church is beautiful way up at the top, but um, just all the little uh, side alleys that are perfectly preserved. Um, with views up and down the Lot Valley. Um, we did talk to a woman who lived um, in one of the houses because they had some beautiful, um, this, this in fact was a giant rosemary bush. Um, and we were talking to the woman about how beautiful the, the gardens were and the flowers and so forth. And she gave us um, an earful because um, apparently one of the problems in some of these villages is that wealthy Parisians will buy holiday homes in these tiny little villages um, where they will go off for the summer. Um, and then they'll plant a little rosemary bush because they think it's quaint. Um, and then while they're living back in Paris, the rosemary bush grows to like 10 feet in high, height and annoys all the neighbors. So even, even in this little paradise, you can see there's, there's a little bit of <laughs> cultural stuff going on that we would not have been aware of if we had not been talking to her. But you can't help but just be overwhelmed by the, the beauty of it all. Um, and here is Kaor, which you can see is a very large town. And it's in the middle of another one of those loops of the river um, in a meander of the lot. Um, I wanted to go here kind of as my own pilgrimage because it's very famous for two things. Um, three, actually, now that I think of it. One is for um, the very beautiful uh, church that you can kind of see here. Um, secondly, for a medieval bridge, which I'll show you close up. Uh, over here. And third, for its extremely good um, red wine, there's a very strong, uh, robust red wine from Kaor, which um, you can buy here. Um, and um, it can be on the expensive side, but it's really, really good if you ever have a chance to try it. And you can go up very high and look down over the city to get, get a nice view. There's the church, uh, the Cathedral of St. Stephen. Um, and probably the most famous thing in the town is um, Pont Valentre, the, um, the medieval bridge with its towers. It um, dates to the 14th century, the very early 14th century, and has become a symbol of the city um, and is now a historic monument. So um, fairly recently, you could actually drive over it, but now it has been blocked off for, um, for protection. And now it's only a historic monument that you can walk on. but it's one of the best preserved such bridges anywhere um, in France. And the cathedral, also very pretty, with its unusual domes, um, which is not very typical of a church of that time period. 
Um, and I'm going to finish the program by taking you back um, north to the coast where we flew out of. Um, on the way, we stopped in Perigueur, which is um, sort of the, the capital of this area. It's one of the larger towns. And it also has um, an interesting kind of Byzantine style cathedral. Um, these weird domes uh, with their little pinnacles, they may remind you of uh, something in Paris, uh, which is the, the Church of Sacré-Cœur in Montmartre. And that's because they were um, designed very deliberately in the same style. It's a sort of Byzantine revival, um, which is not very common outside of France, but there are, there are three or four major churches in France that have this look to them. And this is one of them. Um, also in Perigueux, we, uh, I had to take this picture to prove that uh, people think French drivers are terrible, um, and they often are, um, but I was very impressed by this guy who managed to get this delivery truck through this incredibly narrow street um, with a little help. Um, and I'll mention this only just for humor's sake. I, I studied architecture as my undergraduate work. So this is what is known as um, a squinch in architectural terms. Um, and this is um, an extremely unusual, if you're an architecture student, this is a big deal. This is a double squinch, and they're almost unheard of. So I was very excited to see one. Um, but Perigo is, it's, it's a larger city, um, so it tends to get uh, passed over by, by tourists who are looking for more small, quaint places, um, but it's still very beautiful and well worth a, a visit, um, as is another um, very elegant town called Brantom um, on the River Drum, which is another small village, but has um, an old abbey, um, so it was fairly wealthy in medieval times. nice spot to get lunch. And we also stopped in Cognac. Um, cognac is where it, you where that stuff comes from. Um, cognac um, is a particular kind of brandy. And if it's official cognac, it comes from cognac. Um, it's also a town that is famous for its connection to Francois I, um, the Renaissance king of France. Uh, he was born here and has there's a lot of connections there. Um, but if you're interested in, um, it's a nice place to stay, but also if you're interested in cognac, um, there are a lot of places where you can visit cognac producers um, and see the distillery houses and, um, and visit the vineyards around the area. Here's the chateau where Francois I was born. You may not remember him, but um, you probably uh, know the place he's most connected uh, with which is the massive chateau in um, the Loire Valley called Chambord. Um, that was one of one of many chateaus connected with Francois, but um, he is the the king who created that, uh, and that's probably his best known, the thing he's best known for. And we'll finish in La Rochelle, another good sized town. This is probably seventy five thousand people, so it's pretty big, um, and it's a it's a seacoast town, fishing port. Um, and as I said, we flew into La Rochelle because um, Ryanair had really cheap flights from Ireland. So we flew through, through Ireland and for, I think, 29 euros, we flew to France um, and um, it was a great place to come into. Um, and we stayed there for a couple of nights on the way back just because it's a beautiful um, Atlantic coast town, very different, obviously, from the inland uh, Dordogne communities. Um, it had more of a feel of almost a feel of southern France, even though it isn't southern at all, but certainly a seacoast feel. Um, many, many excellent fish restaurants. And it's guarded um, because it was an, an, an Atlantic port. Um, it was also very important um, centuries ago for protection. So the harbor has these two very large um, towers on either side. Um, which could be connected by chains um, to prevent ships from, from uh, getting inside the harbor. 
but it's uh, it was a very nice place to spend uh, the last couple of days um, eating fish, wandering around um, a pleasant city. Enjoying the harbor, the seaside. Um, here's the amazing train station. France has some incre incredible train stations, as well as an incredible train system. Um, and every year they have a contest to vote on what is the most beautiful train station in France. Um, and I know at least um, once or twice La Rochelle has won. Um, here's City Hall. And so we'll end there and I will turn off my screen sharing and let's take some questions. Where is my stop share button? There we go. So let's look at questions and make sure. Um, someone's mentioning they had to leave. Uh, yes, Robert will be um, recording. I have to apologize earlier. I, I called Robert Thomas because yesterday I did a program for a different library um, where the host was named Thomas, so I haven't adjusted my time. Um, so yes, Robert is going to um, record this and we'll make it available. Um, was this part of France not impacted by World War II? Well, yes and no. That's, that's a, actually a very good question. Directly in terms of bombing, no, because much of the area that we are seeing here was part of uh, Vichy France. So this was occupied France under the Vichy regime. So uh, uh, it was certainly affected because the Germans were occupying it. However, um, it was not affected in the sense that um, there was much less damage due to um, active bombing in this part of um, in this part of the uh, the country. Most of that was concentrated in the north of France. Um, Let's see, what else? How long were I? Whoops. I'm trying to check both the chat and the Q&A. Um, how much time would I recommend? Um, I think we were there for two weeks. I think you could see most of the highlights in a week or a week and a half. Depends on what you're interested in. Um, it would be worth flying into Bordeaux also, uh, which is very close. And Bordeaux is a city that's well worth seeing. Um, you could easily do two weeks in the area, um, but I think a minimum of one week um, to see all the real, the most important stuff, but it depends on what you like. Again, um, I like it because there was a mix of, there's chateaus, there's villages, there's outdoor activities, there's um, there's the prehistoric caves, there's, there's so many different kinds of things depending on what your interests are. Um, so, if you are, if you try to focus on certain things, um, I think you could hit the highlights in a week, um, but you would probably regret not spending more time there because it really is so beautiful. Um, someone mentioned that French Canadian ancestors would probably um, most likely have departed uh, for the New World from from La Rochelle. That's quite possible. La Rochelle is one of the biggest ports, um, along with Bordeaux, um, along the Atlantic coast. Um, and someone asked if I speak French. Oui, je parle français très bien. Um, oh, yes. Someone mentioned the movie Ever After, which I think had Drew Barrymore and someone else whose name escapes me. Um, it was kind of a romantic comedy. But yes, it was filmed at the Chateau de Um OK, so I think that's all the questions there. Now let me check the Q&A. How did this region fare in the heat wave in the past summer? Um, well, it was hot. <laughs> it was hot all over France. Um, in fact, ironically, I was in Greece, which usually experiences the worst of that. And this year, this summer, Greece was much better, um, nowhere near as hot and nowhere near as um, many fires. Um, I had friends who were traveling in France at the same time, and it was unbearable. It was up to about uh, between 35 and 40 degrees Celsius. Most of the time, um, the Dordogne did not suffer too much in terms of 
uh, fire damage. Um, most of that was towards the Atlantic coast um, in the area called the Land, which is kind of south of Bordeaux as you head towards Spain. Um, and I think from what I remember, most of the fire damage was in that region, um, but all of France um, and definitely Southern France um, was very, very hot. Um, someone asked, oh, and I'm ashamed I don't remember the answer to this, which side of the river was English? Um, I believe, I'd have to double check this, but I'm almost positive that counterintuitively, it was the southern coast, the southern side. Um, because don't forget, this was, um, the reason it was English is we're talking about Eleanor of Aquitaine. And um, so Aquitaine is actually the area south of what we're talking about. So if I'm remembering correctly, um, and if I'm wrong, I'll tell uh, Robert and he can include it in the email. Um, the Aquitaine was the area south of the Dordogne River that was controlled by Henry um, and Eleanor and, and so on and so forth. So um, ironically, um, for a certain part of history, England was south of France, which is a little a little strange, but um, can I recommend the best times of year to visit? Um, maybe without too many tourists. I think in general, Western Europe, Eastern Europe too, for that matter, spring and fall are definitely the best. Um, the summer season is the worst, July and August in particular. Um, August is a terrible time to go to France because all the French are on vacation. So um, Paris is empty and everything is closed. The prices get jacked up. It's hot. So don't, definitely don't go in August. July is the same, only not quite as bad. Um, June was very pleasant. There were there were tourists, but it's not overcrowded. I would say if I had my choice, I would go May or September, um, and even into October when the weather is still pleasant um, and the um, the wine harvests are going on. It's a if you're interested in wine, it's a great time to be there because there's so much of the um, the recolt is going on. So that's that's very nice to go. I, um, I think I would go almost any time except the dead of winter and the height of summer. Um, and um, some, I think somewhere else there was, I think I missed a question where someone was asking about a car. Um, and yeah, I really think unless you have an enormous amount of time, there there is public transportation in this area, um, but it's pretty limited and it would take an awful lot of your time and coordination. So um, renting a car really will make your life much easier. And driving in France is is a delight. Um, you know, just driving around the little the little roads. It's if you can drive in Boston, you can certainly drive in France. Um, so I wouldn't be intimidated unless you're an extremely um, nervous driver. It's it's very nice. Um, someone asked about oh in Sarla it's. If it's pedestrianized, how do you get your luggage to the hotel? Um, that depends on you and your hotel. Um, we tend to travel just with backpacks. So we parked our car a couple hundred yards away and just walked in, no big deal. Um, if you need help with that, any of the hotels that you're likely to stay in will certainly have someone uh, help you with your luggage. There's, there's no need to worry about that. Um, someone asked, where am I giving this talk from? Um, my dining room in Wakefield, <laughs> which is where my home office is. If you're wondering about um, the background, the background is my house in Greece, which is where I would love to be right now and where I was last month. But um, uh, right now I'm in Wakefield where it's cold. Um, what else? Um, how long ago was I there? This was a few years ago. I would say this was probably about 10 years ago, um, but not a whole lot has changed. Um, there are not many tourists in my pictures. Um, that's because I don't take pictures of tourists. <laughs> I will sit there for 15 minutes if I can get a better picture without a lot of people in it. Um, however, no, when we were there, um, there were tourists, but it was certainly not overcrowded. Uh, like I said, I think if you were there in Ju July or August would be unpleasant. I think it would be too crowded. Um, most other times of the year, 
I, I don't think you'd find it unpleasant. Um, and driving around is fine. And, you know, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, did I miss any other questions? Um, I've shown us many, many great places. Which are the ones not to miss? I assume you're talking about this program, not all of my programs. In this one, um, if I were to redo this trip, and if you had a couple of weeks, I think I would um, fly into Bordeaux, spend a couple of days in Bordeaux, um, because it's an absolutely gorgeous city. Um, if you are interested in wine, I would devote a couple of days to exploring the wine region just outside of Bordeaux, because um, some of the world's most famous uh, wines come from that area, and it's a very pretty, beautiful country. And then I would just rent a car and work your way up the river, um, stopping in places like Bergerac, Sarla. Um, and again, um, what you visit, I think, depends on what you like. So I'm a big fan of prehistoric art, so I'm not going to miss the prehistoric caves. If you're not interested in that stuff, skip it. Um, the villages, there's a lot of beautiful villages, some with very important uh, history attached to them. Um, but after a while, you might be like, eh, they all look alike. So pick three or four and then do other things. If you like outdoor activities, definitely uh, do some kayaking along the river. It really kind of depends on what things interest you the most. Um, I will include um, right now. Um, oh, can I do that? Uh, send chat to ever. Yes, I'm going to just quickly put my email in the. Whoops. Um, if anyone has any specific questions that did not get answered, or if you have um, very, you know, personal questions about planning a trip there, um, feel free to email me. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions that way. Um, someone is, oh, hi, Shelly. <laughs> Um, is this the same area where Marcel Pagnol set my father's boy? You know, I don't know. I want to say that, no, I'm thinking of the other ones, the Manot of the Spring. Those were set in a different part of France. I don't remember, actually. But I think I'm also now remembering someone referred to um, a set of books that I love. Um, I don't know if anybody has read um, any of Martin Walker's um, Bruno Chief of Police series. I think I saw a question earlier and I, I must have skipped over it. Um, Martin Walker has, oh God, there must be at least 10 um, books in his series now, and they all take place in a fictionalized village that is uh, in the area around Sarla and um, his his village is totally fictionalized, um, but you will immediately recognize the area in his books, and they're wonderful books. Um, they're very good um, mysteries with a local feel, um, good characters. Um, if you like um, uh, Louise Penny, um, I know a lot of people are big fans of Louise Penny's French Canadian mysteries. Um, because of the village life and very strong characters. If you like Louise Penny, I think you would very much enjoy Martin Walker because it's a similar feel, just a different location. Um, but his, he's got very good writing. The, the, the stories are a mix of lighthearted but serious. He deals with serious issues in, in French culture um, and French politics, but um, the characters, there's some humor and there's food. And so uh, his name is Martin Walker. Um, and I would definitely suggest um, trying a couple of those if, if you want a, a fictionalized version of the area. Um, do I travel with a backpack? Yes, I haven't, I have not checked luggage on a plane in 25 years. Um, I refuse to. And I have a decent sized backpack that I can fit at least three weeks of clothing in. Um, and the more you travel, the more you get used to what you need and what you don't need. <laughs> so, um, Like they say, um, put out all your clothes, pack your bag, remove half of it and double the amount of money you're taking. Um, so I think that's all the questions. 
Um, Robert, are you still there? I'm here, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> and Jeff, you can call me Tom anytime, as long as you keep coming back. I realized uh, so, as soon as I said that, that I was thinking of the wrong wire. <laughs> no, no, don't worry, don't worry. So uh, folks, let's give Jeff another big virtual round of applause. Uh, Jeff, so, thanks so much for being so generous with your time. Uh, folks, um, you'll receive an email from me tomorrow with a link to a feedback survey, a link to this recording, and information about some other upcoming armchair travel presentations. And I promise, 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 I haven't quite started booking 2023 yet, but when I do, uh, we'll see Jeff in January. Uh, okay. So thank you all so, so much, and I hope everyone enjoys uh, the rest of their uh, week, and I hope they have a happy Thanksgiving. Yes, me as well. Um, thank you all for coming. And uh, Robert, don't forget, feel free to include my email um, address yep. um, again to so anyone who would like to um, contact me. I'm always happy to talk about travel. I will definitely do that, Jeff. Thanks so much. Wonderful holiday. Bye, everyone. Bye bye.